I supposed to look at you? Am I supposed to look at that? Oh, man, you're supposed to look at me. You don't want to look at the camera. Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. This is your host, Jack Young. Today in studio, we got uh, Brother Vince Williams, and uh, we're recording this podcast during our women's conference with Debbie Pride. And um, so we're hiding out in my office. It's very <laughs> scary when you got 170 ladies uh, in the building and you're way in the minority as a man. So we're going to hide out here and do a podcast. Uh, but it's great to have uh, Brother Williams with us today. So welcome to the podcast. All and right. first time I met Brother Williams, he helped me move into the parsonage at uh, First Baptist Church of Black River. And that was in 2008. And you tried to kill me. And I did try to kill him. We had this elliptical machine, and uh, it was supposed to go upstairs. Of course, this is the wife's orders, and she wasn't uh, she wasn't around, but she made sure that that elliptical, she had a spot for it upstairs, and it didn't want to go upstairs at all. And uh, it almost killed us trying to get that thing to fit up that stairway. And I was on the bottom part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were. So, um, But you you were up in Fort Drum at that time. At uh, Fort Drum Baptist Church. Yeah. Yeah. How long had you been? When did you start um, that? Now you're asking me to use my memory. My yeah. memories in the conference. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get your wife. Let's go grab her oh. and uh, get her in here. But, yeah, you were up there and for, for several years before. And um, so you were, you, you were uh, oh, I can't remember. Yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, two, two or three years before that. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so, so today we're going to look at, uh, both of us, I, I was uh, nine years outside the gate of Fort Drum, uh, New York, and ministering to the military. We had a very uh, predominantly military church. I'd say at least 90% of the church was military. Uh, when I went there, it was kind of like a restart. We had uh, two members, two voting members, both of them ladies. One of them was just home for the summer from college. And so we uh, hit the ground running and just door knocking and everything. And, um, of course, right around the church and then right outside the gate, it was just all military people. And the church filled up uh, pretty quickly with, with military and that's because that's who was there. And, and so I got the military ministry for nine years. And uh, I, I felt like I was telling Brother Williams yesterday, uh, is I was telling somebody and I wasn't half paying attention to what I was saying. I said, yeah, I was stationed at Drum for nine years. <laughs> I said, oh, I mean, I pastored outside the gate of Fort Drum for nine years, but it really uh, did feel like, uh, you know, we were in the military along with the military when we were there. But you have a military background. Yeah, six years in the Air Force, and then we were missionaries to the military for 20 years. Yeah. So you're a short-timer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty, yeah, twenty years. Uh, you can retire after twenty years, I think. Yeah, in the military, at least you can. Um, so, so how how did you, uh, or why do you feel called to the military? Well, uh, the Bible verse when uh, there, I can not even remember which one it was. Now, one of the people that got saved that Jesus healed wanted to follow Jesus, and Jesus said, "No, go back to your people." Mm -hmm. And. Uh, you that's, mean the maniac at Gadara? Yeah, yeah, that was, would fit you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's it. It was the maniac at Gadara. Yeah, and so I decided I was going to be that maniac and go back to my people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's something um, special in the Bible, uh, especially in the New Testament, having to do with military people. You see, like three Roman centurions, yeah. uh, both following the Lord, and um, John the Baptist preaching to soldiers. He, he never tells them to exit the military, be content with your wages, do violence to no man, meaning um, don't oppress or bully, shake down the citizenship that you're um, occupying. It doesn't mean don't go to battle. Right. Uh, and then be content with your wages. We see Roman soldiers a lot of times overthrowing the government, having a coup. And uh, it's, not no. just, it's not just Roman. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, just don't obey, <laughs> obey orders. And uh, he tells them to stay in. Luke three fourteen. Yeah, and and I think of also the Roman centurion uh, who had a burden for his servant, and he had great faith, such great faith, not found in Israel. Uh, he says to Jesus, "I being a man under authority," um, he said, "Say the word, and my servant will be healed." And so he understood God's authority because he was in um, 
he was a soldier in authority, so he had some special knowledge of the of the economy of God because he was in the service. Do you remember that church in uh, Kansas that protested the military funerals and all that? There's yes, I do. Um, yes, God hates soldiers yeah. and all of those banners. It was unfortunately a Baptist it, church, yeah. and um, they went up yeah. to Fort Drum and were protesting outside. Oh, I didn't know that. I think that was must have been before I got yep. there. And yeah. so we took our church and we made banners. God support soldiers. Uh huh. And we we uh, uh, protested them. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that is good. That's good. And um, yeah, so you were you were outside of Fort Drum for some years, and before that, you were at, you were um, Keesler, Keesler Air Force Base. Keesler Air Force Base. What's the difference between Air Force and Army? Uh, <laughs> that is. I know there's a difference. There's a difference between Marines, Army, yeah, oh, that's, Air Force. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It, and it, ministering to them. Oh, it is extraordinary difference because the people are are so different. The Air Force treat you like people. Yeah. And so you got to just treat them, uh, treat each other on a, a people level. Uh-huh. We're in the army, no matter what rank you are, the ranks below you are not treated as well. Yeah, sure. And so it's more of a, a military mindset with the army. It's not as much of a military mindset in the air force. Sure. And so you're, you're viewed as equals in the air force. Isn't that something? Yeah. It's, it's totally different. In Air Force or elitist, because I've heard it, you know, outside of Air Force Base that uh, people are too good to go to church, and then the Army, they're too bad to go to church. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to yeah. convince them Yeah, I one wouldn't say that, because uh, <laughs> back when I was in, there were a lot of people that were told, you know, you go in the military or you go to jail. Sure. And so that was even in the Air Force. It's just you had to pass a certain number of tests. Uh-huh. You know, you couldn't just join the Air Force like you could the Army. And even the Army, before... the uh, Gulf War started. Yeah, they even had more standards, but they really dropped them after that because they needed bodies. How about the Marines? Yeah, I've never worked with the Marines much. I worked with cross I like, trainings. I know like Doug Fisher's got a ton of Marines in his yeah. church. I think he's surrounded by about six or eight yeah. bases, different bases. Something that's crazy. Yeah. But um, the the Marines I did work with that were cross trainees, they're different because they they don't question authority where Army and Air Force would. Yeah. Uh, Not at all. And they don't, a lot, most of the ones I had wouldn't look at you. They're trained not to look. Like to look at you eye to eye. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize that. We experienced that when we went to the Ukraine in 1994, like right after the the wall came down. Like people don't look each other eye to eye. You know, they don't want to cause trouble. You know, they've been oppressed for so long. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. If you don't look people in the eye, (laughs) that's like, um, I guess a form of aggression or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's really something. Um, yeah, the, so there is a, a military culture that you have to get accustomed to. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, there was a, definitely a lot of adjustment. I do not have a military background, but I was able to uh, minister to the military. And, I, you know, I thought we were, you know, somewhat uh, successful up there. I think it might have been refreshing for some of them to like go to our church because I wasn't telling military stories, war stories. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, but you definitely assimilate to the culture that you're surrounded with. Cause I talked to other people and it's funny. Even now people say you served, right? You were in the military. I'm like, no, no, I never, <laughs> I don't know if being around soldiers for that long rubbed off on me. And then I know some of the guys that had been at our church and had laughed and talked on the phone. He's like, it's funny talking to you. You, you sound like a, an army chaplain, <laughs> like, you know, I just get the terminology and everything else and kind of soaked it in um, after a while. I don't, so I don't think if you're going to reach the military that you necessarily have had to been in the military before. No, I, I think it actually helps to some point. And like you said, you didn't talk about their the military. They don't like to talk about what happened. So it might have been refreshing that for them to go to church and I'm, you know, and I'm, you know, my illustrations are not back when I served back in my day, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that type of thing. Um, and so, yeah, you can minister to military uh, successfully, I think, and, um, you know, not have had served before. Now, there's a huge difference, too, between stateside military churches and mm-hmm. overseas military churches. Yeah, what's the difference? Uh, overseas, it's much more unity there mm-hmm. because they're, you know, that's all they have is themselves. So let's say you're in Germany and nobody speaks English, really. Yep. Uh, that's not their first language. 
And so you're among strangers, you live among a strange culture in a strange land, but you go to church and then there's all these people from stateside there and you can kind of. Yeah. And stateside, maybe what, what do they say? 10% do 90% of the work. Sure. Uh, that's not overseas. Right. You probably have 80% of the people involved in the work of the church. Yes, and so it, that is your social environment. That is yep. your social structure, and that is the people that you spend time with. That's where you find your babysitter. That's where you, yep. you know, you find your friends. Is in your church overseas, and I've heard that. But overseas churches, whether it's Japan or Germany or Korea or any of these places, are very tight knit. Where stateside is kind of the same struggles. Uh, I think that we have just with at a regular church about emphasizing to the soldiers, the importance of church, importance of your uh, community, local New Testament church, and going together. But then, I, I you know, you find at the military, um, since they, when they're stationed, there's there's um, not the extended family around, that once they do get plugged into church, you are their family. Yes. And so you are super tight-knit yep. to that community, and you form super strong bonds. The things, the thing that um, was fatiguing for me, in all transparency, I like knew three years into pastoring a military church, like I can't do this forever. <laughs> <laughs> I just did this because it was heartbreaking when you have people you're so close to, and it's like your children are constantly leaving, and these people who are like your family, you're so bonded with that they're going. And it's funny because you know you'd I'd be begging the Lord, don't let them leave, change the plans, right. you know, but. God's like, this is a military <laughs> church, Jack, and this is what they do. Now, how old were you when you started at Black River? 29. Okay, 29 is old for the military. Right, it's funny because Julie and I would be in our mid-30s, we'd be like the oldest Old. couple in the church. <laughs> and there would be a few that yeah. might have been a little older, but not many. So you become the parent figure at yes. a young age. <laughs> and it, yeah, or uh, either the parent or like the big brother, because yeah. I'm like five to ten years older than them, and I've been that that much more life experience. And it's, yeah, so you don't, I mean, you know, yeah, if you worked with the military at 30 years old, you're going to be older than a lot of your peers. And, yeah, it was a, it was a great experience in that sense, because a lot of churches, if you took, a church when you're 29, you're like the age of your members, kids. Yeah. Um, and then there when I left, I was 39. So, like some of the privates, their parents were my age. Yeah. <laughs> and I used to joke with them, you know, hey, listen, I'm old enough to be your dad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it's and easier to reach them on base because of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I go on base with gray hair and uh, you keep it shut uh, cut short like most independent Baptists do. <laughs> yes. And they, they don't know if you're an officer or not. No. So you automatically got respect. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. And, and then especially, you know, you, you know, you're, you're trim slim. So you look like you could definitely be a, um, a high ranking officer with gray hair. And then myself, you know, they say, well, Oh yeah, he, you know, he's mid 30. So he, he must be some sort of officer. Or, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they do treat you automatically with respect. Yep. And the one thing that I learned up there too with the military is I still to this day, if I'm talking to um, somebody, I'll say, yes, sir. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Because you hear that All hundreds time. of times and I grew <laughs> to like it. And so I thought it was very respectful and that's something they drill into you yep. in the military. And I'll still use that today here. And, you know, if I'm in a convenience store, what I, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You know. Yeah. <laughs> now the funny so, thing is, my parents taught me that before I ever went to the military. Right, so right. It was an easy transition. But if you, yeah, if you don't know that, the military will teach you that real quick. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, so there there is a lot of you know there is a lot of respect given, and it is that um, uh, like like the centurion, I'm a man under authority and in authority, and they understand authority structures, and. Um, and then in a church, you know, we would have people from, and it's an amazing evangelistic opportunity because people don't have that social structure uh, up there. They don't have grandma's church to go to on Easter. You know, they don't have aunts and uncles, whatever. Once they start coming, um, you see like rapid growth spiritually. Yeah. And it's um, so it's so amazing and encouraging um, how, how people do that. But yeah, so somebody doesn't have a church culture and they go to um, church and they'll say, hey, Jack, I say it's pastor. 
And it, I only have to tell them that one time yeah. <laughs> because, because of the military background, yeah. <laughs> I like, in, I don't care what you call me outside, but you know, inside this church, you know, I'm pastor. So, um, yeah, they, they, boom, they understand that concept automatically. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great, um, opportunity. Speaking about Thanksgiving and stuff, mm-hmm. a lot of people would always ask me, boy, you must have a huge gathering for Thanksgiving. And I was like, no, they usually, that's when they take leave and go mm-hmm. home. So the church goes down those days. It's funny, yeah. And so you're planning in your preparation. You're gonna, just, you know, just you're gonna have to play it by ear because they don't even know when the bl- they call it block leave where the whole yeah. base is leaving. Uh, I remember one time I scheduled a summer revival, and that's the last time I'd ever do that because <laughs> I mean, like eighty percent of our church was on block leave, and um, so nobody was in town yeah. for the revival. I thought I'm not gonna ever schedule a revival again in the summer because you don't know when that block yeah. leave's gonna be. I say that doesn't happen overseas because you got no place to go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They'd just be chilling out at home. Yeah. They really don't want to spend all the money to to fly everybody home for uh, you know, a few weeks in the summer. Yeah. And so it, it is different. Your long term your your planning is all cyclical. Yeah. In a military church, because you you don't know who's going to be there in a year or two. Uh, the fellow who took uh, over after me, Brother John Collette, doing a great job up there. Uh, so he's been come, coming, be coming up on four years this next spring. That, um, but yeah, I remember telling him twenty different ways. Less than the people who vote you in, they're gonna they're gonna all be gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all the people that you see on Sunday, just realize. That uh, you know, ninety percent of them are not going to be there, you know. So, uh, but he knew what he's getting into, and he's former army, and um, and so so he's doing a fine job up there. So it is cyclical, coming and going, and so you got to plan. There's there's going to be um, there's going to be harvest times, and then there's going to be famine times as well. No doubt about it. <laughs> I remember during the surge. In 2010, were you, you were around, weren't you? Yeah. I think that, um, I think you might have been. What happened with Brother Williams is that um, you were looking to go to a different church, if I remember correctly. Well, n- not originally. What happened was I had lost my job because it, the, the company I was working for full time while we had planted the church went to Shanghai, China. So we got Shanghai. Okay. Yeah. And, and I couldn't find another job at the time. And so I just took that as a sign God wanted me to go elsewhere. Yeah. And so he mer- he merged his church with my church and brought over three families? Yeah, it was at least Because you families. had the Martins, they had a bunch yeah. of kids. And then you had the Maldonados, yeah. they had a bunch of kids. And I think there was like maybe one other family. And the funny thing is that I think they were all there till the summer, and that was in the springtime. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, filled up a big section of our church with your church. And, and at the same time, you're, you know, everybody out there, they're going to be moving on. But I think it was right around that time. There was the, um, surge. If I remember, if I got my timeline correct. And our church on Sunday would be so packed that a lot of times we dismiss the uh, junior church first and it'd be like 50 kids in junior church, at least. Um, I remember the hunters, they were doing the junior yeah. church down there. And then, um, and then you had, uh, Chris and Sumiko and Chris was married to a Japanese lady and they were helping out down there. And the junior church teachers were swamped <laughs> yeah. at that time. And it was a bunch of like really essentially unchurched kids. So they were like hooligans wild. And I'd say, how did junior church go? Oh um, man. Uh, but they, they had sometimes now, 55 kids yeah. down there. Now that's a difference. You asked earlier, difference between army and air force. The yeah. children are a big difference. Okay. In the Air Force, the children were relatively well behaved. Okay. On on post, well, it's not post in the Air Force; it's a base, mm-hmm. and uh, you didn't have issues with the children yeah. on Air Force bases. But up at Fort Drum, they had a curfew on base in the housing, which blew my mind because yeah. you know the Army is so much gung ho and you know, oh, oh, oh. And yes. But they couldn't control their kids, their own kids. Yeah, it might have been a different culture. Like the guys are away training more, or yeah. and then no, they're they deployed more. Yes. And so the kids are kind of like, yeah, go yeah. go outside and yes. do whatever. You, yeah, the, race cane. The most deployed base in the Army was Fort, Fort Drum. Fort Drum, 10th yeah. Mountain Division. Yeah, absolutely. They're gone all the time. Um, yeah, so we'd have sometimes 55 kids in the junior church. And that that was when you were there. And then also... 
I remember one Easter there was eighteen babies in the in the nursery, <laughs> <laughs> and so so the church swelled uh, swelled during that time. Uh, but I knew because you kind of have a sense of things when you're yeah. pastor and you're going over the prayer list. You're like, you're like, like I know this is like a mile wide and an inch deep. I'm like, I know this is not <laughs> like it's not like at a normal church. You're like, wow, we have 200 now. So it, like, even if we maintain or this, like, like no, it's like not like yeah, that at there's, all. There's no no none of that <laughs> long term planning. It doesn't work. And even financially, <laughs> it was funny that um, during that time, you know, the church is packed out, but the offerings were were not that great. Like it would, be, you know, you would uh, have packed out church and then the offering, like, come on, man, hey, you know, there's a ton of people there. So what's going on here? And even, you know, later on towards the end, there were, the offerings were like way better. We had some more solid families. We had some more solid locals towards the end. Um, so, yeah, at a military base, there's going to be feasts sometimes and there's going to be famine other times. Like, you know, we would have, um, I would say that, when it was when it was good and was stable steady we would have like 130 when it was like doing really right. good and then it dropped down to like 70 and so it's hard for me like I'm a linear thinker <laughs> you know thinking that you know you start here and you end up here and you build and yada yada no you have to erase that from your mind if you're military it's going to be cyclical like you can't you can't um you can't just like count or like accumulate and you're not accumulating anything. No, you're not. And uh <laughs> and so one of the things that helped me you should be doing more talking to my talk. <laughs> one of the things that helped me is um studying the book of Acts when we preached through Acts when we were there, and I'd always remind the church this is our church is like the the book of Acts, and our church is like the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. Except we don't have to travel. Yep. <laughs> Everybody, you know, all the different places are coming through. And, and the best part of that is wherever they go, you've got friends literally around the world now. Absolutely. We could go anywhere in the country and we would have all sorts of doors open to us. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I have the, you know, you, you do too, the blessed bondage, you know, we're pastors. So we might get away for a Sunday a year or something like that. <laughs> but uh, if we wanted to be world tra- world travelers, yeah, could be. we had to have open doors all over the world to us. Yeah. That, yeah. Let's talk about that, that opportunity. Well, I've got, literally, I've got invitations from 50, 60 different countries that people saying, come on over, you know, anytime you want to come. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've got, I'm not one of these people that get, you know, 5,000 Facebook friends, fill it up. Yeah. But every friend that I have is a real friend. That, that, and, sweet, that sought you out. Right. And most of them are the military people. We just had a, a lady from Fort Drum move back to New York, and she's been in contact with us ever since she left Fort Drum. And we've got, like, the Maldonados you mentioned. Mm-hmm. All these people are still our friends. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah, fa- yeah, fast friends. And, and so with the military... You have um, people stationed at that base. There's, you know, the the South disproportionately has more people join the military yeah. than the North does. So you have a ton of people from the South all over, um, you know, from from the coast and Texas and Oklahoma and New Mexico, like all throughout all these different regions, all different backgrounds, um, all different kinds of cultures. There, uh, one of the things that I loved about um, our church is the military is like the United Nations. I think it's, yeah. <laughs> I think it's the biggest melting pot yeah. uh, from the world. So you'd look out on a Sunday morning, you know, and we consider a diverse church in the United States, like black and white, where really in the military, that would just, that would be boring. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like just black and white. Are you kidding me? I, like not only do you have black and white, but you have like Filipinos. We had people from Nepal, um, and we um, we were talking about the uh, uh, Palauan family that we had, Pedro and his wife. They both got saved in our church. And I never heard of the country of Palau before I met Pedro. And he was my fishing buddy, man. He was a good <laughs> fisherman. I could call him up. He'd tell me exactly. Yeah. What, and, but he, he grew up on an island of 30,000 people. It's its own nation, Palau. And it's somewhat close to Japan. And again, 30,000 people nation. And we had at one time had five Palauan families in our church. It's like, what, what, the whole nation join the army? 
Um, and so, yeah, you look out, you have all these different groups, some people from Asia, you have an African family from Africa. And that's another thing with the military is it, um, you don't, I guess you don't realize, a lot of people don't realize that you can join the military from any nation on earth. You just can't be an officer. Right. <laughs> Unless you're a citizen. And, but you, they give you a pathway to citizenship, which yep. I think is great. I am for immigrants. That's fine. Illegal, legally. <laughs> legally. And that pathway through the military, I think, is great. Because they get the training. They get the vetting also. Because the military is going to watch you to see yes. if, whether or not you're a criminal. And um, and then also give you that path, oh, pathway yeah. to citizenship. Yeah, there's yeah. another part about that, too. Because when I was an instructor, which was four years at Keesler, and so I taught all these people from different countries. A lot of them, even if they didn't do well, I, I, this is probably kind of the hidden secret, mm-hmm. we would have to pass them. Because if they failed in their course in America, <laughs> they would go back as a disgrace to their country. Yeah, And a lot of them would be put to death. Mm-hmm. And so we had Saudi Arabians we trained. We had uh, Kuwaitis that we trained. Uh, I'm trying to think of the, the officers. They would send their officers mostly to us. Uh, that were joint, the ones that were joint trainers with you. We didn't just train our people, but uh, these people, if they didn't do well, they were they were a pariah in their country. Right. So it's like um, same thing people say with New York City. If you reach a military base, you're reaching the world. Yeah. Because there's a small segment of the whole world at that military base. So you have a, just a tremendous opportunity to reach all these different people groups and uh, so it's a, yeah it's a di- very diverse group and um yeah a, a lot uh, a lot of blessings that way as far as reaching people um do you support a missionary from spain by any chance what's his name here I, i'm trying to, that's what i was hoping you'd come <laughs> up with no i don't yeah okay, see, i don't think so see the way i got going to church i got saved when i was a child because of the bus ministry in mm-hmm. norwich new york mm-hmm. But there was a young man at the chow hall in Spain that was at the beginning. He got saved by missionary Matt Stenzis when he was had to work there in Spain outside uh, Torrejon Air Force Base. Okay. And so this young man checked the chow hall tickets coming in. And uh, we would have discussions, you know, and we couldn't have long discussions unless I was the only one in line. Yeah. But we'd have discussions all the time. And uh, he really helped me in my Christian growth, that young man. Huh. Well, he ended up, he was then 18, 19 years old, but when he, he ended up becoming a missionary, he came to the United States for training mm-hmm. and then gained support here and went back to plant churches. Yeah. And uh, uh, I didn't know it at the time. I was looking for him for years. I, I, it took me 30 years before I found him, mm-hmm. Prob- well, probably closer to 25, but I couldn't remember his name because it is, <laughs> it is a common Spanish name. Okay. I mean, just, uh, you know Pablo. Yeah, it's not going to come to me all, all of a sudden. But come to find out, my friends here in New York in Independent were supporting him. Wow. And if I would have come up six months earlier than when I did in New York, I probably would have met him because he was on furlough. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, amazing. What are what are some of the um if if a guy's outside of a military base, what are some of the outreach um outreach things that you'd recommend? Yeah, uh, especially stateside is the the one that I would uh, really be concerned with because overseas you don't you don't it the goal really in a military ministry is to get a few people on base on fire for God because if they do they'll reach their people oh, they'll propagate yeah and so that's that's always the goal yeah but here stateside especially at Fort Drum when people are deployed. You got it. There's there's so many needs in families. Mm -hmm. Uh, What we used to do because we lived right next at the at the time was military housing. Now it's been opened up to everybody, but at the time it was military housing. And even on post, we had snow blowers, we had shovels, and we would just drive around looking for ladies that were out there. Their Mm -hmm. husbands would buy the big uh, fifty inch TVs, seventy inch TVs, and pay you know seven yeah. eight thousand dollars at the time. Yeah, but wouldn't buy a snowblower. Right, and then they would leave. So then, yeah. then they would be deployed. Yeah, and so this and wife would be out yeah. shoveling, and she's out there with this little military issue <laughs> shovel, fold up shovel, trying to clear her driveway. Yes. Yeah, and so we would just go around, and they would ask us how much we would charge. We say, if you want to pay, she can, but we don't charge the military. Yeah, 
And we got in so many homes that way. Yeah. And uh, children, the wives need somebody to help them with their children, just to help them get out because they're stuck with their children all the time. And uh, and you would think military would help military. They don't. No, no. I, I remember one, um, when, we, when we first moved to Black River, my office was right. It was in a room. I was facing my neighbor's house. And I was in there. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I was studying. And I looked out, and um, the gal next door, her husband was deployed. Uh, her daughter is the same age as my daughter. They were both babies at the time, born the same day, actually, on the 23rd of December. And um, so I look out there, and she's got her infant daughter in one of those things that straps the baby, like, to, <laughs> to her uh, her chest, like, right, you know, just like you carry a baby around. And she is snow blowing and like leaning forward. And like, if she felt she fall right on top of her baby, I can't think of her name anymore. I like went like around the door and said, Hey, listen, I'm going to snow blow here in a minute. Go in the house. Don't, I'm going to snow blow your driveway. And, the, and so, like, for the rest of the winter, yeah, I'd snow blow my driveway and then I'd snow blow her driveway at the same time. But yeah, there was a lot of care that was needed there when all these guys were getting deployed. We'd have send-off services, and even um, when you were pastoring there at Fort Drum uh, Baptist Church, uh, I remember having you over for deployment. We'd have these send-off services, and we had um, our biggest one was 18 guys. We had 18 right. guys all being sent off at the same time, which means we had 18 families in the church where the man of the home is not there, and and uh, that region of the country is not their uh, home. It's not like they, hey, they can call their uncle or father or brother to come over and help them. It's like, no, they need yeah. their church family to help them out. Absolutely. And uh, they need a lot of help and attention at that time. Yeah. And it's pretty interesting being a pastor when like all the guys are gone and you're like <laughs> pastoring a bunch of women, but uh, they, yeah, they need help that way for sure. And that's a good way to really touch people's lives. Yeah. And, it, and it's really, it's, you got to be there for them when the husbands come back because mm -hmm. they don't know each other. And no. there's a, an adjustment. <laughs> there is. In uh, the deployment used to be for, um, at first it was for 16 months, I think. At the, at the, at, and then they changed it to a year, but then they'd have a two-week two week, uh, furlough in the middle of the year. And that was always terrible because the guys would come back and they're all, um, their minds are overseas. And it takes them about 10 days to unwind mm -hmm. and start acting normal. And then just when they start acting normal, they're sent back overseas. Yeah. And then the wife, you can tell she's devastated because yeah, it's herself. only halfway between uh, the deployment. It's only a halfway mark. So before I left, I don't know what it is now, it was nine months. And nine months was way better. They got no furlough. So it's just like you're there for nine straight months and then they come back. Whoever made that decision, that was a good decision. Yeah. Uh, so it's a whole lot better. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of support needed during that time. And really, um, you're limited in your capacity as a man to minister to women. Hence, you know, the women's conference with women speakers yeah. <laughs> speaking to women right now. Um, so a lot of the godly ladies in the church really yeah. took up, yeah. um, the role as like spiritual mentors, yeah. spiritual mothers. And, and your wife is very busy. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so she's, she's going to be helping the ladies, uh, very, very much. Um, I think also just plain outreach, um, you know, we all do door knocking for your church and for mine, and that's very important. Um, we do mailers here and I think that's important. We do advertising on Facebook and other things for different events. I think that's important, but in a military base, I think it's very, very important yeah. because you had the constant changeover and in a military base, you go out door knocking through the military communities like that you get this um, almost every weekend, whether they show up or not, it's one thing, but they'll say, Oh, it's weird that you knocked on the door. We just got into town and I'm a Baptist. Yeah. I'll, I'll come visit your church. And like you never get that hardly ever <laughs> probably in Syracuse yeah. or where I'm at, uh, but there's the military base. You will get that. Um, and so you get, you, you know, you get those homes, you can have your little contact. Okay. Uh, let's see door 542, uh, guys, Baptist looking for a church and you might have to go back and visit them five times yeah. before he comes, but yeah, you can go out and make that contact. And then on Fort drum, you can't door knock. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> I gotta... could never, you know, what? towards the end, <laughs> I couldn't even get on base. I used to go and right. eat, eat at the, um, at the, 
what's the big grocery store, the PX, and then um, they had all those um, restaurants. I used to go eat there, and I'd see mm -hmm. the different guys, and I'd meet guys there and eat at mm -hmm. least once a week. There's a secret to knocking doors on base. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, uh, it is not your right. We know that. You yeah. know that. Yes. Everybody listening doesn't know that. But yeah. in federal installation, there are no rights. Right. <laughs> so you can't just say, hey, I can go door knock, and that's my right. It's yeah. not on a federal installation. But uh, most people, if they didn't want you there, they would report you if you're knocking on their doors, and the security police would show up. Number one, if they do, you don't give the security police know you're there to help their people. Yeah. And they don't want to kick you off. Mm -hmm. They have to kick you off. Mm -hmm. And so you're always cordial and nice. You don't, you don't lie to them. You just, and, and you go off the say. But what I learned to do was this. First of all, you don't go in, in your suit. You don't go in a white shirt. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, don't go in your, um, your, yeah. uni, your, uh, yeah, your, Baptist, your Baptist uniform. Baptist uniform. <laughs> right. Yeah, don't wear your uniform. And uh, because that does two things. First of all, it doesn't identify you as a cult, and it doesn't yeah. identify you as, as a church. <laughs> okay? Right. So they don't know that. And they don't know if you're, uh, you know, a member of the military. Right. They don't know that. And so, like I said, if you're older, they're going to respect you anyway. Mm -hmm. But then if somebody does complain, you just go to a different street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the security police are going to show up. Yes. And so you just go to a different street. You don't argue with people. You don't get them upset. You just no. go to a different street or you just leave the base and so you, come back so, another yeah, time. Yes, so you definitely have to tread lightly. Yeah. Yeah. It's and Going it, incognito. And there's, of course, um, even, even now there's always a lot of apartment complexes and things that are private property that you do the same thing. Right. Uh, and then they might call your church and say, hey, you were on private property putting your, yeah. you, know, you littered in our place, you know, with your tracks. Um, I, I apologize. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> and then you do it, you hit them again in a yeah. year or two. Um, yes. But one of the big things that we did is mailers. Yes, mailers. Work. We mail to Fort Drum three times a year. We do it in the spring for Easter, Easter advertisement. We would do it in the fall, but we did this back to school postcard, and then we would do it in the winter for a Christmas candlelight service. So three times a year, everybody on Fort Drum would get that. I mean, all right. the barracks and then all the other housing where the families lived. And so that there was a constant reminder that, hey, we're right outside. And special events on post, the air shows and that type of thing. Yeah, go to that and, and uh, get in and on anytime you can. And then also, like, um, originally, I don't know why security tightened towards the end of the time that I was there. Um, I believe... Ter terrorist threats. Yeah, it must have been. So I, so I couldn't go to eat outside the PX. But when I did before, I'd meet a lot of different soldiers and say, oh, hey, hey meet my pastor, you, gotta, you know, and meet a lot of different people that way. But yeah, it's, you know, you got to keep your constant community presence. And it's important. Um, it's real important in a military base where you got people coming and going. It might be just for training. They might yeah. only be in town for three months uh, or two years, but uh, you're going to have that turnover. Yeah. And if you don't stay on top of advertising and getting your, your church in front of people, they're not even know you exist. And, and they know time. at any particular time they could die, which is at the normal world out here. They rarely think about that. No. But that's on the soldier's mind 24-7. Right, and that's why, like in the surge, the 10th Mountain Division was going to take over for the 101st Airborne. And uh, the 101st Airborne, where they're taking over for, had like th almost 50% casualty, something mm -hmm. crazy. They were like right in the junk. So all this infantry from the 10th Mountain Division knew that there was a high possibility that they were going to get injured, and they knew that there was a possibility of death. And so they they were coming to church, and they were, you know, uh, getting saved. They yeah. were, you know, getting They're in church. very interested at that point. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> hey, you got to take advantage of it. You won't it, have them for long. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, it's right. It's kind of like in the jail. Um, you know, I always just tell the guys that, hey, listen, you know, you hear about the jailhouse religion and everybody gets converted. I don't want to be one of them. And I go to jail and get converted. Like, so let me tell you something. Anyone who ever came to Christ, they were in a, a jailhouse of some sort yeah. or another when they came to Christ. And I think it's the same way with the military. They're in a crisis. They're looking for something. 
Uh, I'm not worried about. Um, There's no atheists in a foxhole. Right. <laughs> and so all of a sudden they're, you know, face to face with their own mortality. Yeah. You know, they're, they're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. And they're going to look up uh, for help. And so, yeah, you take advantage of that for sure. That's for sure. Um, so deployment, we talked about that, taking care of the women. We used to have an awesome send-off service. If somebody's listening to this and want to know the details of the send-off service, I know I've got notes about that and um, kind of some of the things that we did. We'd give out, like, uh, bookmarks with all the soldiers' names on it. And then we had a church, like, covenant that um, every day uh, – to my best ability, I will hold up these men before God in prayer and everybody signed it. And it was a, like a beautiful, like, um, picture that, uh, we would uh, hang up in the church with all the signatures on there and, you know, just any, you know, just encourage those guys this way. We'd give them gift bags to send off. And then also, uh, during their deployment, I always send them, you send them like cookies and also the, um, the mail was always, it would go through, go through those guys' care packets during the year, things like that. Um, Messages. But, yes. Yeah, that's why I started collecting so much MP3 preaching because they get over there. You know, t- today it's a little bit easier because you got more cell phones and stuff, that type of thing. But I would make sure I would send them loaded with messages because they got no other time to do over there. They can't go off post over there. No. Go wandering. What, now, when you were there, um, when you were up near Fort Drum, um, the MP3 player was a big thing. Like the i, what were they called? I had the cl- iPod. I it was an iPod. Yeah, I can't remember either. Classic or whatever, and yeah. you could hold fifteen thousand songs, <laughs> yeah. but you could download sermons on that. Yep. And I remember you giving me uh, a disc with, I think it was like fifteen hundred. Yeah, I'm up to three thousand. Okay, plus now. sermons. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was that was an important mm-hmm. thing during that mm-hmm. time, and and guys could listen to all these sermons over there, um, and it's not so the technology has advanced now where people just go online and. But there's less less internet over there available. Yes, it's very sketchy. So it's yeah. still a valuable tool. Yes. So yeah. So it's important for them to download this stuff. Yeah. Uh, in case they're disconnected from the internet, they can get that later. Yeah, that was an important thing. Um, so the send off service, and then. Also, guys coming back. Is, PT, is PTSD real? Well, it's as real as can be. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, been for years and years and years. Yes. And, yeah, we talked about the different names of it. Um, I think it was called Shell Shock in World War II. Combat Fatigue. We've pulled up that name. Um, but, yeah, the, yeah that, that is a very real reality for guys. They used to consider, uh, I don't know how much you read up on it, but they used to consider back in the, the olden days, they thought those soldiers were crazy. Mm-hmm. And so they would commit them, many of them because of that. To some t- sort of sanitarium or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, fortunately, they, they recognize what it is. And unfortunately, the treatment for it, I think, is faulty. For instance, yeah. le- the military, their answer is, of course, it is a godless government entity so they have you know hundreds and hundreds of shrinks on staff but yet even today i was hearing a few months ago that uh, the rate of military suicides is is um, astronomical roof yeah it's amazing. especially now well the reason i don't know if you know the reason no. now is whenever you get a president in that does not support the military they don't have a purpose Okay. They go to battle. It's like, what are we allowed to do? Yeah. We're not allowed to do anything. We're sitting ducks. Yes. I mean, how many people were left in Afghanistan? And uh, these these soldiers knew these people. And I, I think one of the causes now, yes, I think one of the causes now too is, because um, I remember, uh, now I've been here since uh, 28, 2018, 2017, uh, but the guys who are being deployed and going over to Afghanistan uh, before I left, their whole mission was to keep their buddies alive. Yep. And so they really realized that at that point that the war had no purpose. 
Uh, and then also we see what happened in Afghanistan. And so all those guys who lost buddies over there, yeah. who um, lo- the, lost yeah. limbs, legs, yeah. that, and, or even they didn't do anything, but yeah. they gave 10 years of their life to right. the military. And just the civilian casualties that they saw. Mm-hmm. Because they don't like that. They don't like seeing kids blown up. And, no. And sometimes they had to do that when they had to shoot a suicide bomber or something like that. So it weighs heavily on them. And they said, you know, the, the big difference between World War II and Vietnam is Vietnam, we never um, we never took territory. So mentally, like with, you know, D-Day and we're gaining ground, the Germans push back, but we're pushing towards Berlin. And then finally there's an end. So you think, ah, freedom, ticker tape, yeah. parade. Uh, we've accomplished something where in Vietnam, you just like left the base and did your sweep and then gave the whole region back to the Viet Cong. And then don't you mean Afghanistan? (laughs) Right. So, so Afghanistan is another Vietnam, Yeah, you know, where it made no political or right. Any, any type of military sense, exactly what we were doing. And then we see the devastation with us uh, trying to pull out of um, Afghanistan, all the Americans left behind hurts the soldiers. And then all these people, they made bonds with um, these Afghani interpreters and other friends of America over there. And then we turn our friends over to the Taliban to be decapitated and um, persecuted and killed and uh, and so they're it's very depressing for them. Yeah. And so even the guys, the young guys in, that are in there now, are thinking, you know, what am I? What is the purpose of this military entity? That they, they don't feel a sense of pride, accomplishment, and there's that sense of emptiness and purposefulness, non-purposefulness yeah. or something. Whatever I'm trying to say. And there's you that, need that. You need that in life. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're making a great sacrifice. Yep. You can you can accomplish great things if um, you you realize there's a there's a lofty a purpose. purpose at the end of it. Yeah. So PTSD is real, and um, it's real not for the guys not for the guys only that have faced combat, but then also for the guys who went overseas and were tightly knit and tightly purposed together with uh, a group of battle buddies and went over there. Oh well, well that's another thing when mm-hmm. you're you come back stateside. You lose all that. Mm-hmm. You, if you get out of the military, you, nobody has that same kind of camaraderie, no matter where you are, and you can't fit in because you're looking for this, and it's not there. There's a wonderful book. Again, I never served, so I can't. You know, I've never experienced uh, PTSD and that uh, that capacity. You know, the same. You know, we all go through trauma, right? Uh, that's life, uh, but not not in the sense the military does. So uh, Sebastian Younger wrote a book. It's called Tribes. And that was a very helpful book for me. And, you know, if you're listening, it's only like a, probably a 120, 150-page book. But he talks about when he was in Sarajevo as just a reporter and how he was attached to a group of military personnel and how that they were all so tightly knit. Every single person in that group what had a purpose they were all important um and they all like would lay down their life for any individual in that group and they're all held you know within high esteem of each other very very important integral to that group so when sebastian he came back from sarajevo he like went through ptsd and he didn't even realize what he was going through he came back and there was like pointless people weren't looking for him it wasn't he didn't have a sense of importance in his community or whatever else, you know, was going on. Uh, and then, so he he uh, equivocates PTSD to the sense when you're overseas, and um, here's, what guys, here's what guys deploying would do a lot of times, is they were really secretly looking forward to deployment. Yeah. Because when you're deployed, uh, you're on a mission, you're with a group of guys, there's something deeply instinctive, uh, that goes back thousands of years about a group of guys going together to fight the enemy on a foreign shore. You're leaving your own family and going out there. Um, and there's something simplistic about, hard yeah. but simplistic about that life, is yeah. that there's no worries yeah. on the outside. Yeah. And today, the one difference is that they didn't have in the old days, if, you're, if your relatives contacted you, it would have to be months over letter. Right. Today, they get a letter from their wife, hey, I'm leaving you. <laughs> yes. I mean, a call, a text. 
or even and so or even if it's not that bad, they don't get no, a dear John little things. So they Zoom call with their wife, yeah, or and she's like, I don't know what to do, John. He's yeah, going to get kicked out yes. of school, and yeah, yeah and, and then and then so they have to, things. so they're like um, very worried about things going on at home, which they shouldn't be. They should be focused on. Yes. I, um, I was reading, I think it's in Chris Kyle's book, who had the most confirmed kills in any American war. Um, he was staying, if I remember the story correctly, in one of um, Saddam's castles, like one of his mm-hmm. estates. And he was staying in a room there. He said, I got to take a picture for my wife. And so he gets out his phone. He's going to take a picture of the room that he's staying in, and he realized, hey, I don't have any pictures up of my family. i got to put them out. So he put some pictures up of his family, took a picture of the room that he was staying in, some big swanky room in Saddam's castle. And um, then he said, as soon as I took that picture, I took down the pictures of my wife, took down the pictures of my kids because I cannot think about them yeah. and stay alive. Yep. Yeah, so they go over there. You can't entangle yourself with the affairs, affairs of, of this, this world. world. Yeah, that's what, exactly what Scripture tells us. So wounded spirits, tell us about this. Yeah, Doug Carriger is a, I believe, 32-year uh, military veteran army, and he is a specialist in PTSD. And he has acquired uh, some, well, he's written books about it, mm-hmm. which really helped, but he's also acquired some property in Winona Lake. It used to be the... Yeah, the big Bible conference up there, right? Winona yeah, Lake Bible well, conference. Well, yeah, but the property he acquired it used to be the girl's home. Mm-hmm. That uh, I'm not well, gonna remember his name. His last name was Williams. <laughs> it's hard okay. to forget that. <laughs> okay, yeah. But uh, he acquired that property, and mm-hmm. he's turning that into a a soldiers retreat. Okay, to help men. Well, it's not just soldiers; it's anybody that's got PTSD because it's not just military that has PTSD. Yeah, but right. That's where his his main goal is. But uh, he's re- turning it into a retreat, and they're going to have retreats there for people that have PTSD, so they can go there and get help. And it's, it's really got ahead of him at our church. And the worst part was, is, you know, it was during COVID time. So oh, okay. he couldn't get as many people as I was hoping in Syracuse, oh, New York. So if somebody Googled wounded spirits, it would, it yes. would the link would come up. Yep. So, or yeah. DougCarriger.com. DougCarriger.com. And he's got a link that to the wounded spirit, wounded spirits website. Yeah. So wounded, they, okay. Look what I call it. I always, yeah. Wounded spirits, not wounded soldiers, wound, wounded spirits, Ministries, Wounded Spirits, Doug Carriger. Okay. And it, like here, he's got, they got a, a uh, conference coming up soon up there. Yeah, that'd be, uh, yeah, that'd be very, September uh, and September. Yeah, September that'd be passed. very helpful for some people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that'd be very helpful for some people. And um, so, yeah, PTSD is real. These guys coming back, uh, there's like a lost sense of purpose. Sebastian Younger in that book in Tribes, he talks about the, like the bombing of London. Over thirty thousand people died, uh, and the the leadership of England thought that there's going to be looting, there's going to be suicides, there's going to be mass spread, depression, things like that. And the truth was the exact opposite: that uh, th- uh, theft went down drastically, suicide evaporated. There was no suicide whatsoever. People came together in community spirit. Uh, and that's the spirit of warfare. Yeah. And then, believe it or not, like people in London look back at those days at the as the greatest days of London. And I and it was kind of like also like after nine eleven, yeah. New York City was the as a city to be in. Everyone was being a neighbor, watching out for each other. There was tender love and care that you would never yeah. see uh, in New York City. And so these guys, when they go off to warfare, they see the worst of man, and then I also see the best of man. And then they feel tightly knit to their command, to their group. And I think it's the kind of tight-knit group that a church yeah, is supposed to be, yeah. commanded to be. So they come back and they lose all sense of purpose, all sense of control. And, um, and yeah, then where before they were singularly focused upon one thing, uh, and that was the war. Now, when they come home, they got to take out the trash. They got to, you know, take Junior to the soccer game, and they got to. Um, and then nobody's—they're not important to anybody. Nobody's calling them, and there's a sense of lostness and um, meaninglessness, purposeful. Yeah, and it's, it's a dramatic difference. That's mm-hmm. a big. It's 
it's a dramatic difference. Yeah, so that's a good thing. Hey, before we, we get done, tell us about your database. Oh, Military Get Saved. Uh, MilitaryGetSaved.com? Uh, no, MilitaryGetSaved.Tripod.com. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> had to throw the tripod in there, huh? Yeah, well, I had to. It, it wasn't my choice. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. If I couldn't, though, I wouldn't. Somebody actually bought Military.org and linked it to it. I don't know who. It was somebody in Oswego. Oh, nice. But last I knew, that link was gone, so they didn't keep up the payments. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if somebody wants to, to do you that. You need to buy ahead. it, man. <laughs> yeah, I thought about that. Yeah. I just never get one of those round to it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you need to get a round to it. But, yeah. But uh, I've kept this database. I started in 1991. I was uh, on deputation, of course, and got churches li- uh, listed so I could find places to to go and have meetings, but also I wanted to be able to find places for soldiers and their families. Mm-hmm. Uh, if a soldier got saved and he needed his, his family witness to, or his wife, if she stayed wherever she was to find churches for him. So I started that database and I tried to, well, just to make a long story short, uh, John Sampson was a military guard troop from, I believe he was in Washington, if I'm not mistaken, Washington, Oregon, up there on the, on the left coast. Yeah. But uh, he wanted me to find a church for his mother in Cincinnati, or Ohio area, one in Cincinnati. But I couldn't find anything within 300 miles mm-hmm. of him. And so I said, it's never going to happen again. So I started collecting churches. Some yeah. people collect stamps. Some people collect, I collect you churches. You collect churches. That's awesome. <laughs> and so I started doing that. And, uh, and that's a lot of work. Yeah. That's it, like your baby. Yeah, that's my baby. How many churches are on there now? Uh, I've got six, as of today, 6,224 that stand on the King James. Yeah, which, yeah. I've got a bunch more that I'm not certain where that, where they stand, but totally I've got uh, just under 10,000 churches listed. And you're constantly updating that if yeah. they change pastors yeah. or locations or whatever, yeah. and that's a big that's a big task. Yeah, I, I help for, uh, the military helps a lot because when they look for something, if they find the databases off they'll send me updates missionaries will send um, updates yeah we use your database all the time and um for the folks listening i'm I'm sure that he doesn't want me to advertise this but i would send you an email (laughs) and and say hey i've got a i've got a family going to this town and then he problem with that and he'd email me back like five churches and then i could print it off and give it to that family and um so you have helped locate tons of people just in our church alone. And I've even used it since I've been here because we had different people moving to Florida. Like if you're in New York, that's where you're going to move to is Florida. Uh, you're going to go somewhere in the South. I mean, so we're the most emigrated state right now. Uh, so people, so people are leaving New York state in droves. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know why. uh, (laughs) Yeah. Government spends a lot of, a lot of money on us. I mean, they love us. So, um, so yeah, so it was a wonderful help database, military get saved dot tripod dot com. com so visit that uh yeah. and then if you really want a shortcut um just email brother williams and say hey i've got a family move into this or i'm moving to this area do you have some churches you can recommend for me yeah. and he'll, he'll send you yeah it's actually better that way sometimes because okay. some churches i got listed i, I try not to get sued <laughs> so <laughs> okay so if i list a church i don't put all the nuances of the church sure there's some churches that i know that i would wouldn't recommend, recommend. <laughs> but they are there. Yeah, that, that is good. Hey, well, thanks for being on today, brother Williams. And, uh, it's been, it's always, uh, appreciate your friendship. It's always been a blessing to be around you. And I am glad that we are co we're fellow pastors here in the state of New York and sushi aficionados. And yes. Thank you for that. Sushi. We're both right with the Lord. <laughs> we're uh, su- part of the sushi brotherhood. That's right. Sons of sushi. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, we'll catch you next time, everybody. Thank you so much today for watching this podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you'd like to reach out to us by way of email, you can email us at pastoralthoughtsmail at gmail.com. And if you'd like to, I do write a blog, and you can subscribe to that at pastorjack.org. Thank you, God bless you, and have a great day.